Just sort of a general murmur. Yeah, murmur. Okay. You may murmur all you like. <laughs> murmur. What's up, Rainy? Joe, how are you doing? I'm good, bro. How are your how are you? We're coming live from the Rainy compound where he's icing his balls after his vasectomy. How how was that experience, Rainy? Uh it actually wasn't bad. You know, like the first night it was kind of uncomfortable. So I didn't sleep that well, but then the next morning take 400 of Advil and basically feels totally fine. So, but I'm supposed to take it easier for like a week, which is hard to do, but it's for a good cause, Joe. It's for a good cause. <laughs> I've been waiting for a catheter based option for my vasectomy after my, everyone tells me to get a vasectomy because I have five kids, but I just can't <laughs> pull the trigger here. I'm, I'm scared. I don't know that there's like a major blood vessel that you can take to get there though, you know? Oh, there's gotta be a way. It just seems so archaic. I looked at like a YouTube video of vasectomy and it's yeah. like, they're just pulling shit out of there and cutting it. It seems- It's oh. a trip. And the, the weird thing is like, they give you like this lidocaine where they just bla air blast it. So there's no needles, you just air blast it and then goes through the skin. And then you're like wide awake. Like I had zero sedation, no value, or and I was just sitting there like, okay. And the guy's like talking to you, and it's like, okay. I don't know. It just, it does anger me a little bit to know that that urologist that did your vasectomy probably makes two to three times as much money as I do, and we save lives for a living. And he's <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. I think that would be that's not something I would want to do every day. So, oh, cool, dude. What's well, what's doing it, here? Nice, uh, nice sweatshirt there, Joe. What, what, what's going on with that? Ah, uh, yeah. So this is, so I, I believe in team morale and boosting team morale. And I felt like our structural heart team needed a little boost of morale. So I, I somehow convinced our administrators to buy everybody these like structural heart jackets. It says St. Alphonsus structural heart on it. And it's a nice North face jacket actually. And so we got it for like all 50 members of our structural heart team. So like the whole cath lab, the recovery pre-op people. And dude, it has been transformative people love it they're super proud of like being part of the team so i would i, highly, it, I would highly encourage people to do it so and I, hate wearing, I hate wearing white coats so i always wear like a north face because it's just much more comfortable than a white coat my coats are fucking gross anyway yeah cool so, man where'd you get the logo is that your logo i actually our structural heart coordinator's kid designed it so it's actually wow. yeah it's kind of cool so it's kind of like all in the family and yeah. You know, people feel like they've got ownership of it. So it's super stoked, man. Awesome, man. All right, Joe. So what do you want to do? You want to jump in? So obviously neither of us made TCT this year. I know you had a couple uh, birthdays. Couldn't go. Yeah. I was getting my procedure done, which. Um, so what do you want to talk about news out of TCT? Yeah, dude. Well, I, I you know, I think you and I are both what, seven, seven years, out, eight years out now from fellowship. And I think. I think it's helpful to talk to other docs about what is their experience like at these meetings. Cause I'll tell you what, like I've been going to these meetings for eight years. I still have no fucking clue how to navigate the meeting, right. how to manage the massive amounts of content that's created at these meetings. And I end up spending half the time at the bar with friends and catching up with people. Um, so I don't know, like, what do you, what do you do when you go to these? Like, I, I think TCT is great. I love, I love going to the meeting. I love seeing old friends, but it's, it's overwhelming. And I don't know if there's a better way to do it or if I'm just not doing it right. But unfortunately I wasn't able to go this year because, because of kids' birthdays and that was an easy decision for me. But like, what do you, what do you do at these meetings? Like, what is your flow? I know we usually hang out a lot together, but. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. It's, it's, it is it's overwhelming and they're like actually really tiring. Like when you get back from one of those conferences, it's like, Oh yeah. It's not a vacation. It's, it's not, not like, vacation. A like you really tend to get sucked into going, you know, lay it at dinners and stuff like that. Great to catch up with everybody. 
and there's tons of good content, but I, I think it's just hard to know like what room am I going to and, you know, trying to, trying to jump around and, and figure it out, especially when, you know, there's so much interesting stuff going on, but yeah, yeah I always feel a little bit overwhelmed by those conferences. And I mean, you've got live cases, which are great, but you can watch those online. You've got late breaking clinical trials, which are always entertaining. And I, I do actually enjoy watching the discussion on some of the late working clinical trials, because you'll oftentimes get some pearls in terms of the statistical analysis or like, what are my takeaway points from this? What are the next steps? Then you've got like the industry sponsored stuff. So like at the last TVT, I did the Pascal room and that was really freaking cool. I, I deployed some Pascals and pig hearts. Yeah. I actually think that made me a little better yeah. microchip operator, just understanding the anatomy and the deployment steps and stuff like that. So I think I'm going to start spending a little bit more time at the industry sponsored hands-on stuff. Cause I actually think that's very practical. And then you've got kind of like networking. So you can do dinners with industry, you can meet up with old friends and catch up. So I try at least to balance all, all those things when I go to these meetings. But the reality is like, I really want to come home with a couple things that I'm going to take into my practice. And I find that harder and harder to do the older I get, you know, just come home with like two or three, great practical tips for the procedures that I do. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I actually think some of the, uh, just the content on Murmur is great because it's just, you know, big trials, people talking about it. It's like, yeah, kind of, kind of the cliff notes. Um, yeah. so speaking of which, uh, partner three was a big one for us, right? Yeah. Let me present, I got actually have some, some interesting data. So I think this was kind of the big breaker at, T at TCT. It was the partner three low risk five year data and the Evolute uh, four year data, which was really good. So this was kind of the, the big late breaker. This was the first day of late breaking clinical trials at TCT. And this was a highly anticipated five year data from partner three low risk and four year data from Evolute, which is really fucking annoying because it kind of be nice to look at apples and apples at five years. And again, they're different trials, but I think the take home points is that in the Evolute arm, TAVR was superior. I don't know, statistically significant. I, I need to look at that, but numerically superior to surgery. In the partner arm, TAVR was non inferior to surgery. But I think if you look at this graph with the Kaplan Meyer curves, the death or disabling stroke kind of superimposed from the two trials. I do think it's pretty informative because um, these are two super hard endpoints of death and disabling stroke. And if you look, it, it really looks like the surgical arm of Evolute was really high for death and disabling stroke. And the surgical arm of partner was actually very low in terms of outcomes. So it's a little bit hard to extrapolate this and externally validate in their practice. So Rainy, what do you, I mean, what do you think about this? We're both pretty heavy sapien guys. Like, well, first of all, I mean, I think it's hard to draw conclusions because they weren't in the same trial. You know, it wasn't the exact same, you know, head to head. So I think you got to be careful, you know, trying to draw conclusions there. Um, yeah. You know, it wasn't the exact same patient population. They just, they never are if they're in a different trial. So um, so I wouldn't take too much on that. I think, you know, first of all, if you look at these numbers compared to like the original partner trials, I mean, look at the, look at the, it's pretty low, right? Yeah. Rapid stroke five years, like 10%. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I think, you know, all these compared to the original trials, you know, we were part of the original partner trial, right? And, you know, the stuff that we saw back then, I think, first of all, all the numbers have come down. And then, you know, I think both of these were sort of, equivalent, right? Between surgery and, and tavern. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's great data. I think it kind of reinforces if you have somebody who's low risk and they're pretty gung ho on, you know, on surgery, I think, or uh, on tavern, I think it's, it's reasonable. Well, um, I, I but, always wonder what Tierstein said. He's like, if you have two therapies and one's less invasive and they're not inferior, like it's a no brainer to me. Like I, I do still think there's a lot of patients that are low risk that, surgery is better for. I sent two patients oh. to surgery yesterday that I saw in structural clinic, but you know, I think it's also important to look at this. Like, I think people don't talk about your surgical outcomes, right? Like I've always wanted to look at this, you know, you need to know your surgical outcomes at your specific center that you're practicing at. If you have 
dog shit, dog shit surgeons that don't do a good AVR, you know, that's going to favor TAVR for your specific patient population. You can't extrapolate necessarily clinical trial data to your practice because your surgeon's surgical outcomes are probably different than the surgeon at Columbia or Cleveland Clinic, you know, that's enrolling patients in these trials. And I think we saw this, like, if you just look at the four year data, partner three, surgery, 6.5% death and disabling stroke, 4.1% for Evolute. So like that's only, that's 8% difference in death or disabling stroke between two surgical arms. And, you know, what a lot of surgeons say is that they were using a lot of different valves in the Evolute arm. They were doing some minimally invasive stuff they got into trouble with. So I think, I think this just shows the heterogeneity of surgical outcomes for valve replacements, especially now that surgeons are doing less and less AVRs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think also, you know, we do see in this low risk population more bicuspids, right? Which aren't yeah. really going to be represented in this. So I think you just got to be careful to, to not, you know, put every low risk patient in this kind of data. Yeah. Because uh, bicuspid were excluded, right? On, on the low risk trials. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. I think you, you could enroll because I was in partner three. You could enroll functionally bicuspid patients. I still don't know what that means. I think it looks like it kind of looks like the le like one of the left and right or you know right and not or are somewhat fused. But um, but yeah, and I think the other thing that they brought to light with these trials is that um, COVID really disrupted some of the outcomes a little bit when Marty presented the partner three data. He showed that, you know, the pre and post COVID thromboembolic rates were much higher in the TAVR arm than the surgical arm post COVID. Oh. And so it's thought that maybe some of the surgical patients were on anticoagulation and that precluded them from having thromboembolic events. There was also more HALT in the TAVR arm of partner three. So there were about 12 patients who had HALT in the, in the TAVR arm and only one surgical patient. So I think I think more to come, but I think this kind of this can kind of tell our surgeons, hey, we've got good five year data shows this is not inferior to surgery, and I think this will be more ammunition for us to justify tavern in some of these patients. Right. I mean, I think it's certainly reasonable, and you know, if the anatomy looks good, right, it, it, it really comes down to your CT, your anatomy. Do they look good for tavern? Is it a reasonable valve? Not too calcified, non bicuspid. Can you get another valve and down the road? You know, I think those are kind of key questions we have to start thinking about, you know, when you're talking to your patients. Do you get a CT before you talk to your patients? Do you, yeah. Do you know? In fact, I bring them in my office and I show them the CT, especially if they're going to go for surgery, because like this is the problem we're running into now, right? Patients don't want surgery, even if you think it's indicated. So what I'll do is we always see them first before the surgeon. And then I'll bring them into my office and I'll actually show them on the CT. I'll be like, look how these two cusps are fused. Look at all this calcium here. Right. right. This has to go somewhere. And we right. know that in heavily calcified from the McCarr data, we know that these heavily calcified by cuspids have worse outcomes with TAVR than surgery. And so I find that super, I, I think the CT is so important. I mean, Dave Daniels, my old partner, he used to say that 90% of TAVR is planning and 90% of planning is the, is the CT scan. So totally agree. I think it's critical. Yeah. And I usually, unfortunately, can't get that before I see the patients. It's just kind of hard with my patient population and different insurance and stuff, but it would be, I mean, ideal. We're, we're trying to move towards that, you know, where we get a CT and then see them at the same time with the surgeons would be awesome. Turns out we're usually on pretty much on the same page, you know, it's, yeah. it's pretty rare that we have disagreements. It's like, look, anatomically, they're better for surgery, you know, young patients, you know, I'm still under 65, there's guidelines. I'm still going to want them to get, get surgery. Um, and then what's your relationship like with your surgeons or anything? Like, are you, are you friends with them? Like, are you guys really collegial? Is yeah, no, we've got a great relationship. I mean, they're, you know, it's it, like I said, it's pretty rare that we have, you know, disagree. Um, you know, usually we're on the same page with the best kind of treatment for the for the patient. So and occasionally on the kind of in between ones, we'll just talk about it. And um, but look, I'm busy enough. I don't need to do, you know, if the if the patient wants to have surgery and, you know, they're low risk and then, then I'm all for it, you know. Yeah. Which is rare in California. I can tell you, man, it's it's a wild west out there in California. You've got so many shops doing 
20 towers a year and fighting with their surgeons and right. it was crazy they showed in the evolute presentation mike reardon showed the uptick in tavers so this is going to be the first year they do a hundred thousand tavers in a year hundred thousand a hundred thousand we're at a hundred thousand tavers a year wow. 45 percent of patients under the age of 65 are getting taver which is kind of uh, crazy like does that thing appropriate? Forty-five percent under the age of sixty-five. Of the sixty-five and under group of patients that have had an AVR, forty-five percent have gotten TAVR. I thought that was super interesting. Wow. Like, it's a little scary to be honest with you. Like, I love TAVR, but if I'm if I'm like sixty and I've got a bicuspid valve, hundred percent. That doesn't seem appropriate. I mean, I'll you know, that. anecdotally, I had a case last week bicuspid valve. I think our original deployment. I was involved with the case. I wasn't the primary, but it wasn't fully expanded, you know, I mean, it was expanded, you know, the balloon went up, but it's, it's failing at five years. And, you know, I, I don't know that I think that's part of it, right? These bicuspid yeah. valves, you're getting good expansion. We don't know the long-term data. And I certainly don't think, you know, it's not to be represented in this trial. So I do worry about taking a trial like this and telling everyone younger, because I don't, I, especially bicuspids, I don't think we know. And I think those, those ones that are underdeployed because there's too much calcium, they're just yeah. not going to I mean, some of it's like what I said, like we, we have to get better at convincing patients to get surgery, unfortunately, because, yes. because at the end of the day, we're kind of the gatekeepers for TAVR. And I think we, we need to be cognizant of that, that at the end of the day, our obligation is to do the right thing for the patient. And sometimes that's convincing them that they need a sternotomy and that kind of sucks, but it's just the reality, you know? Yeah. And I just do the same thing with you. I'm like, look, all I can do is push stuff aside. I can't cut it out. You know, you have so much calcium. We just don't know. You know, the best thing for you is to go in there, cut that out. You know, it's a little bit rougher recovery, but a couple months later, you won't know the difference. So, you know, I, I think we got to do what's right for the patients and, uh, you know, what's going to give them the best outcome. And, and like I said, like you said, I think getting a CT ahead of time would be in these young patients is really helpful. Yeah. And so I think, I think takeaways from this, TAVR is clearly not inferior to surgery at five years. And in the Evolute arm, looks like superior to surgery. Know your surgeon's outcomes. So if you don't know your surgeon's O to E for AVRs, you should, because that should inform your decision making on your specific kind of patient population of patients. And at least in this trial, it, it didn't look like there was a huge difference between Evolute and, and, and the Sapien valve. Um, and so, yeah, so this is great data. This is good to have. I think this will be practice changing for a lot of people. Sounds good. All right, Joe. So why don't we uh, switch over to case review? How does that sound? Case the way, case the way. What would Joe do? W, <laughs> w, w, w. So this is our, this is our case of the week segment. This is where one of us shows a case. Sometimes it'll be from It'll usually be from the app and uh, we just kind of chat it up and kind of talk about some of the nuances of the crazy shit we do in the cath lab. So Joe, this is a guy who was 90. He had films about a year ago, December 22, right? They decided on, you know, no left main disease, um, right? Didn't look too bad. And then he decided, they decided just to go with medical management. Um, about two, three weeks ago, he was in the hospital with a non-STEMI. He had worsening angina. And then I saw him in clinic and he said, I said, well, do you want to try to do something? I didn't realize that the films were that old. I thought they were from the recent non-STEMI. So I brought him in and then here's the anatomy. So, so this, is, this is your cath? So this is a cath and it's like, you know, now what, nine, 10 months after that original one that just showed the left main. So severe dampening, there's a tight kind of osteo right here. Yeah. Okay. And then it wasn't clear what was going on with the circ, but I think you can clearly see here it's there's severe kind of osteo circ. Big aneurysm at the probably osteo LAD. Yeah. And then that's, kind of a that's tubular. Like a so tubular. I never thought that was distal left main, right? But you can see here, and there it sort of looks distal left main. But on this cranial shot here, kind of lays it out. So you can see the oh, circle yeah. here. Then you've got the aneurysm. 
which I was actually happy to see that that was not involving distal left main, because I think that would be a pain to ask to wire down the circ and everything like that and deal with. Yeah, and the, the LED is super nasty. So, this is the, like these, these 80 and 90 year olds, they get labeled with medical therapy, right? right. And, then, and then they get Renexed and Imdur to death, and then they show up on death's door. I had this in my last job all the time. Yeah. You get someone that doesn't want to do a high risk procedure in an 80 or 90 year old, which I get. But if it's a good 80 or 90 year old that has like a high quality of life, you know, they get labeled with medical therapy. They come in with some non stemmies and it's just like, oh, well, someone didn't want to touch that a year ago. I'm not going to touch it. But this is. I, you know, I totally agree. Medical management. But then, you know, now it's like, OK, now the guy's his ejection fraction is 20 percent. OK, oh. so I get I do a right heart cath. His uh, wedge pressure is 35. Yikes. He's very uncomfortable on the table. Like he's, I had an anesthesia, anesthesiologist there, but you know, he's very struggling kind of laying flat and cardiac output by thermo was 1.6 and his PA sat was like 56. Oh, so, and you can tell his, his LV is not moving at all. Just from the, the appearance of the epicardial coronaries. Like this guy's, this guy's, you know, three to six months away from death, which is, it's not a pleasant death either. That's what people, these 80 or 90 year olds that have these three vessel disease with low EF, it's a shitty way to die, man. Like you're literally just languishing in heart failure for your last three months. So I think, I think this is certainly an Impella case given the hemodynamics. I think it was smart to do the right heart cath. Um, yeah. I think having anesthesia there is super, super helpful because the guy may need to be tubed and there's nothing worse than a respiratory arrest in the cath lab. It's pretty much my biggest nightmare is a respiratory arrest in the cath lab. And then the right's a slam dunk. You can pop a stent in there pretty easily. Probably IVIS it to make sure you don't need to shockwave. And then, you know, I would rota the LAD, stent the LAD up, and then see if you can get away with a single stent in the in the left main um, because it looks like there's a landing zone there. I don't know exactly where that aneurysm starts, but I would I would probably try to single stent just left main call it a day well so i thought this circ was severe the guy's not doing very well like he's just not tolerating so what i did here is i just went in i put a quick stint in the right uh yeah take care of that he has ckd i'm kind of a fan nowadays of like things don't look right you know his you know wedge is 35 just the guys by the way he's hemodynamic his blood pressure is actually fine surprisingly yeah because he's been living, um, living with this for a year you know yeah so like you know, like he sort of looked okay. So I just went in, I stented and just stented the right. Yeah, that's totally reasonable. Take and I do think I, I love Ivis now. I've become a 100% Ivis adopter, but there are certain circumstances where if you don't Ivis, I think it's malpractice. And osteal rights, yeah. you, need, yeah. you need to fucking Ivis every single osteal right because the next person that has to look at that artery needs to know where you landed it and how well expanded it was. And I think it's critical. So you Ivis did, I, I presume? I, yeah, I, I Ivis literally pretty much every case, unless it was a diagonal or something, which I don't really fix those. So so I brought him back. And actually, so I bring him back. Uh, this is Friday. I did that. Brought him back on Wednesday. And the plan was for um, Impella. And he had some pretty, I can't remember why we didn't go single access on him. Hmm. had a specific reason not i think it was because mm. well dude i applaud you for taking them off i think taking i think taking these patients off the table and right. having a conversation with the family and being able to plan out the case i remember our co-fellow nick Hanna. yeah he, he told me when he's got a really nasty case he will actually scrub out of the procedure he'll go to the bathroom you know because you usually yeah. have to go for a big case He'll wash his hands and he'll sit in the control room and he'll look through the films and quietly think about what he's going to do. And I think even if you just do that, but I think yeah. setting expectations with the family is so important. And I always, I kind of paint a morbid pic, like in a case like this, I would tell the family, you know, we've got a couple options. I think medical therapy is the wrong answer. He's going to languish with heart failure. And I think we should try to fix this, but I need you to be, understand that this is probably a 10 to 20% risk of bad outcomes. And I know it's probably not that high, but 
that way you're a hero once everything goes well and if something bad happens at least they've they've heard the spiel you know so yeah yeah what did you tell the family right yeah so i mean quoting like so i usually say that a, a stent you know for major complication right it's gonna be like one or two percent right exactly i say the exact same thing one or two and then what i tell this guy is like hey i think you're probably five to ten times higher risk yep you're a whole magnitude order higher risk but that being said you know then you're looking at five to ten percent risk and it's crazy with that you know in my experience the amount of these people that get through these complex cases is actually it's pretty dang high right yeah, yeah. I mean, how often do you lose it with impellus support? Do you like lose somebody on a table? It's like pretty dang rare, but you know, it can happen. So I tell them that the risk is 10 times higher, but you know, I know some people will quote a 50% mortality with this kind of a case. I, I don't think that's realistic, you know? Yeah, I think 10 to 20, like for my highest, highest risk patients, if I have time to talk to the family, I always say 10 to 20, because I think that's, that's on the high end, but at least then they've said, okay, well, Mom or dad, there's probably a one out of ten or two out of ten chance something bad happens, and I think that's worth, clearly worth the benefit that he's going to get from doing this. So, all right, so you went you went separate access in that seven French guide. Yeah, and I did go seven. I think bifurcation left main seven is just right. You know, Agreed. I actually used to say you know remember it was like eight is if you're going to go if you're not going to go six just go eight, but I don't. I think seven's like just right a lot of times and it really makes these bifurcations so much easier. Like you're not getting jammed up on two balloons. Do you agree? The nice thing about an eight too, like I'll actually put in an eight French sheath in the groin and I'll pre-close it. Yeah. Because, and this is the thing, like people don't talk about this after this is an emotionally, physically burdensome case. You're going to be tired after this. You're going to have totally. sweat all over you. And I like to pre-close them. So I don't have to think about it at the end. I know I'm going to get good closure. And then you could also draw ACTs off the sheath if you use a seven French guide. So I love it. I, I do eight French guides, or seven French guide, eight French sheath, pre-close, and I'm ready to go. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And uh, and seven French radial is a good option too, but not, you know, I think this kind of a case, going femoral is totally reasonable and you're, you're in Pella there. Um, and uh, and I think some of these ones, I'll, I can't remember if it was, some concern, like if I'm really concerned about a, the peripheral access or something like that, I do like to have the ability to control it and be up and over at the end. Oh, That's dude, totally. I totally yeah. agree. Like if you, if you're not going single access, as long as the groin's okay, it's not like nasty. I'll um I'll go contralateral femoral, and that way you can go up and over. And honestly, like it's it's just nice to know you can go up and over if you have an issue. So I, I totally yeah. agree. And especially the sick person, if he has any problems with closure, it's like to be able to go up and over and. You know, tamp nod, get them through that. It's 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 nice to have it. So, uh, you know, I love single access, especially if like one side is terrible. You know, but but uh, you know, I think sometimes it makes sense to just go ahead and get both femoral. So here's the case. So I went in here just wiring it. Um, this is Ivis pre Ivis, and then I what I ended up doing here is I did shockwave. This is probably shockwave. I don't, I don't know what the shot was, but anyways, I did left main and LED based on the, the IVIS, which showed sort of like three quadrant, at least three quadrant, kind of a thin calcium layer. Yeah. And it was mainly kind of in this zone here where you can see more LED. The, the left main itself was more like plaque and it didn't look like crazy calcium, but I did feel like, you know, needing to treat this area that based on the IVIS that shockwave would be good and you know when you see that kind of real thin but big arc like 270 degree arc i think shockwave is terrific for that um, yeah just some images at the end you know they had some nice nice fractures that in it you can see afterwards um so we'll just run through you're going to set up to that diag is that your plan yeah got it so i did some ballooning and then balloon the circ and then here's me trying to lay this out, some sort of crush, whatever you want to call it these days. So it was a little bit hard to, to, to lay this out, but that was actually the best view I could get because of the aneurysm. Mm. Um, but well, dude, I think that's a that's a really important thing about especially with complex PCI and renal and renal issue patients, like a good working view and taking the time to find right. a good working view. It's the difference between a good outcome and a shitty outcome. You know, like you have to get a good working view. 
So you, so this is the, so this is your, are you going to cool this then? Or are you going to crush it? I already crushed. So stand okay. here. And I, I like crushing these cases. Like, look, you've, yeah, I'll go back. So you stand, right? Crush. Yeah. And then now you've got the circus basically out of the picture, you know, in my mind, now you're just dealing with an LED mm -hmm. that you pre shock waved. Um, here's the LED. Oh, it, dude. it just makes Four it so much easier. Now you got an FK Bizzle. But so pot, Ibis, and then I did a final kiss, which. The thing about the crush though is like, the, the, the worst part of a crush is that final kiss and getting, so I always like to rewire the crushed vessel with a Corsair and then put a wiggle wire down so that I can deliver balloons through it. Um, Cause that's, I mean, and, and some operators don't do the final kiss and it's a malpractice in my opinion. Like you have to do that final kiss. Medtronic has this great video you can YouTube that looks at all the different bifurcation strategies and like what the stents look like. Yeah. It's fucking nasty. Like yeah. a crush before you before you kiss it. Like you have to kiss that. Otherwise that circ's definitely going down at some point. So I'll, I'll tell you though, I think left main crushes are so I mean yeah, yeah diet right. crushes are the ones that are a pain, right? I mean that looks um is the aneurysm go away or is it just uh, it's still there and you know and it's it's there. You can see it on Ivis, you know, and there's some there is some unopposed stent cells there. Uh you know, there aren't that within that aneurysm, but I don't know what you could do with that. I mean, you could take like a, it's almost like they need like a super compliant balloon just to kind of like gently push the cells up against the wall. Yeah. But you can see it here, but you know, what are you going to do? I mean, I'll probably just keep the guy on, on adapt and, um, and yeah, he, was so terrific. I mean, he was done with the case now. Um, what do you, are you going to P2 on the Impella and then pulling it? Yeah, he was very stable, but I will tell you this, you know, the two things. Okay. So he's in a fib first of all, but he did have like, especially when I'm hammering the left main doing all these balloons, he did get kind of like this pulses, alternins, you know, I just hate that. That's just, you, I mean, I guess it could have been a fib related, but when you see that variation in the, the pulse yeah. um, pressure, it's like, I don't know, it's just a sick heart. Um, but after towards the end of the case, you know, he, he was pretty stable and uh, went down to P2. Uh, human dynamics were fine. And um, yeah, just pulled the impel at the end of the case. Did you give him protamine? And I did give him protamine, yeah, because he was preloaded. And um, I think we've talked about this. I think, you know, if it's, I don't think protamine is, um, it's not thrombogenic, right? It's, it's just, all day long, dude. Protamine's like the most underutilized bleeding avoidance strategy for complex PCI, in my opinion. Like, there's STEMI data for protamine. Like, really? Very sick. Yeah, they've done they've done STEMI data. It was a two B three A's, but if you preloaded someone, you're good. Oh, preloaded? Yeah. If that if your if your platelets are good, and I hear people say, "Oh, left main, you should never use protamine." I mean, first of all, it's the biggest you know artery there is, so it's very unlikely to thrombose if your platelets are. You know, if you have two antiplatelets on, and you, I mean, you know how much these things bleed afterwards. Yeah. So I, I think protamine coming off of a, you know, preloaded. If they're not preloaded for some reason, then I won't. You know, and I, I kind of hate that because, like, you know, like a STEMI, and you've got, you know, you're going to be, if you have to, especially if you leave an impel in there. Yeah. You know, you're, you know, you're going to be dealing with it. But a lot of times, I think I'll give them Bolinta, and then a couple hours later, I'll, I'll reverse. Yeah, it's totally safe. I've never had an issue. And actually at TCT, there was a, a really interesting randomized trial out of, I think, South America that looked at routine use of protamine in TAVR. So you can extrapolate that to large bore access versus provisional. And so the routine people got one gram per hundred units of, of heparin. The provisional people only got protamine if they were bleeding or had bad hemostasis. And it was like light years beyond uh, a benefit for access complications in the routine protamine arm. So yeah. I really think pro unless you have a good reason not to, protamine should be routine for every large bore access. Surgeons use it like fucking vitamins. Yeah. I mean, they love protamine and they yeah. do great with it. So yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of fear that you kind of just have to get over that it's going to like, it's that it's pro thrombotic or something. It's really not. It's going to reverse heparin. 
you know, a couple hours later, it's going to be gone anyways, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, if you've got the platelets good, I, I think it's a huge benefit. Decrease your bleeding, your calls from the nurses afterwards. So let's talk billing. So you, so I think this is something people don't talk about enough is billing for something like this. So you've got your Impella, which is a measly 6.25 RVUs. You've got repeat angiogram, right? Which is six RVUs. Cause you have to say clinically indicated for repeat angio cause you did it within 30 days, right? So make sure when you do your billing, you say coronary angiogram clinically indicated for change in symptoms, right? And then three stents, because you can bill for multiple stents in one setting. And so how how uh, what what would you what would you bill here? I would bill modifier twenty two for the for the crush. Um, so modifier twenty two for those that don't know, you get twenty five percent more RVUs, and it's clinically indicated for any case that is twice as long as usual. And I think, dude, I think you deserve a modifier twenty two for that case. So I would do modifier twenty two for all three stents and say that it took twice the usual time due so, to so i put in two stents but there what what arteries would you would get coded there left main lad circ okay i don't even know what we ended up billing on that one yeah because that dude that's the difference between like a 60 rvu case and a 31 if right. you don't if you don't bill appropriately and that's dude you should be getting like that you just did a percutaneous bypass on that guy like it's i think it's fair so I would build modifier 20. Yeah, my, and you're my, right. These cases. I, what's that? I was going to say, these cases take a lot out of you, right? right? I mean, it's, it's, you finish one of these cases. It's like, I, I now, especially on my days, if I got a case like this, it's going to be, you know, a couple more easy ones. But, but, you know, this is not a case to start at the end of a long day or something. Cause like, you just get tired from these things. My indication for billing modifier 22 is if I sweat below my boot line. That's when I, that's, that's when I, because that, that, you know, you've been in there for a couple hours working your ass off. I think it's, I think it's important. So, so nice job, dude. That's a great case. Yeah, no, anything you do different. I don't know. I think, uh, no, I think I, that's perfect. I mean, Kulo versus Crush, you can talk all day long about that. Just pick something you're good at and do it. You're good at both. So I think it's a perfect result. And that guy's going to do a shit ton better. So what do you, so are you going to see him or are you going to send him back to his general cardiologist? I'll usually try to see these guys once just to kind of tuck them in and, you know, see, because sometimes I don't really see him that much afterwards. So I do like to try to see him once and then send him back. Um, but uh, yeah, he was super happy. He's one of these guys. He looked great. He's 90. You know, it doesn't look like he's 90. looks way younger. And uh, he was, he was super, super happy afterwards. And Newport you know, Beach but, 90, man, it's a lot different than Boise 90. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah, no, there's some some healthy people here. So, um, but anyways, he, like he did great. We'll see him follow. I think we kept him another day or two. His EDP was actually interesting. It was like ten when I did that. Um, so I don't know how accurate that is. What you go off of? Uh, would you have respawned him on that, or were you just going? No, we already made the decision to do an Impella, and you know, I think at that point it's just a function of whether you have the access to upgrade to ECMO if he if he shits the bed. But I wouldn't. You, you kind of already made the decision yeah. to use Impella. I don't think the swan's really going to change much. I know Lombardi likes to leave a swan in for his high risk PCIs and he thinks the PA pressure is a good warning sign. So if you start seeing the PA pressures go up, that's a sign they may crumb. Um, I haven't yeah. done that, but I know some people do. They'll leave the swan in and look at PA pressure during the case. So yeah, interesting. But. All right. So that's my case. Thanks for the, uh, the feedback on it. Good, good to talk about these sometimes. Baller, bro. It's a good case, man. So, murmur updates. Murmur updates. Murmur <laughs> updates on murmur. So, what's going on in the app? What have we What have we been working on? What can the uh, the murmur community look forward to in the coming weeks, Randy? Good question. So, we're working on uh, trying to get some more specific groups around these, you know, interest areas and uh, get those, you know, hopefully get some industry sponsorship. So yep. that we can pay people to be good moderators and have the time to put in and make good cases. Um, I kind of think that's going to be a key thing for this, for the growth. Yeah. So specifically, we're looking to start an LAO group so people could talk about Watchmen and Amulet. I think right now, I don't think anyone has any fucking idea what to do when it comes to Amulet versus Watchmen. 
I know I've had like a handful of Watchmen failures that have been frustrating because of heavy trabeculation or just like extra, extra lobes. And so I'm really looking forward to having a channel where we can talk about Watchmen cases and see what everyone's doing. I haven't started doing CTs before, but it seems like at TCT at least, everyone's doing CT. Um, Ahead of time there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's become kind of the standard. People are using wow. CT. And now the companies, the companies are even sending you like kind of three Mencio analyses of what their devices would look like. So I think the space is evolving and I think it's just gonna get bigger. And so I think we really need a group dedicated to LAO. And um, so we're looking for sponsorship on that from Boston right now. And then tier, we're looking to start a tier channel. I think with Pascal coming on the scene, um, we're gonna need a place to talk about tier cases and, and micro stuff. So I agree. A lot to learn there too. All right, Joe, sounds like you got Somebody in the background waiting for you. So. <laughs> I need to get my vasectomy. I'm going to get my vasectomy soon. You've, you've inspired me to <laughs> cut my vas deferens in half. Yeah, I think you've got enough kids, man. All uh, right. Guys, until next time. Later, bud. Later. Murmur out. Murmur out.